All right. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Brian Haley, and this is Swami Nathan. Um, I work at Red Hat. He works at SUS, and we, we still seem to get along, even though we're. <laughs> oh. So today we're going to talk about this very long title, Neutron Port Binding, and the impact it has on unbound ports with DVR routers with floating IP. So if you can remember that, then uh, that'd be great. Um, so first, a quick agenda. Um, I'm going to do an introduction and a little background on the technology um, on, for Neutron with DVR and, and other things. Uh, and then we'll talk about some Neutron port binding, what it is, uh, how DVR, DVR router scheduling works, um, how we handle the floating IPs with, with, with DVR, and then some of the limitations we have when we're using unbound Neutron ports, um, which is the, the issue. Um, that we're having with Octavia. Um, and then we're going to go over a proposed approach um, that we have to handle these unbound ports in a different way, some of the design considerations um, that we made when, when fixing this, and then some of the future plans we're working on uh, for unbound ports, uh, unbound ports so that uh, we can do this for, for other cases. So first, this is the shorthand uh, name for the, for the um, discussion, bug number. Basically, this, this talk came out of the, this bug and the discussions around how to fix this bug. Um, there's a very good explanation in here that we're going to try to cover. If you're, if you're interested in um, please go look at the bug, because Swami has written up a very good um, intro. So I'll cover a few of the, uh, the background things on, on neutron routing. So in normal legacy mode, um, we use what we call uh, centralized virtual routers. Sometimes you'll, you'll see it as legacy in, in the documentation. Um, and diagram looks more, more or less like this, where there's, a, there's network nodes. Network nodes have all your routers. Network nodes connect to the external network and the internal network via tunnels to the compute nodes. Compute nodes have your virtual machines that sit on um, integration bridges. But when one virtual machine, say virtual machine one green, wants to talk to virtual machine two red, instead of talking directly to it, it has to go all the way to the network node across the tunnel, through the router namespace, back out again, and all the way back. So this east-west um, communication is a pretty long path, and that wire can get pretty hot, basically. So we made it better, but complicated at the same time. So this is the, the DVR picture. And I, I know, it's, um, I guess it's maybe be, probably easier to read up there, maybe not. But in DVR, we solved two problems. The first one was the east-west, um, where, say, VM1 red can talk to VM1 green. And instead of going all the way back to the network node in, in the green box, it would go onto the integration bridge, BRINT. It would go into the router right lo locally, and it would get routed right there, right over to um, back into the integration bridge and back up to the other VM. So that solved the east-west problem where we didn't have to go across the wire. And, uh, and as well as going to a local VM, if it needs to go to a VM in another compute node, it, it gets routed locally, and it gets sent directly to the other compute node across the tunnel. So network nodes are um, not used for east-west routing, basically. They're really only used for default SNAT traffic um, and a few other things. So um, and it, also in this diagram, we do. Uh, north-south traffic. Um, and I'll just skip to the next slide, since floating IP is your north-south traffic. So you know, how do you get your, your instance from the public network? Well, you use a floating IP. DNAT makes it go in and out of um, uh, the namespace you know, onto the integration bridge into the VM. So with the centralized router in the first picture I showed you, the, all the floating IPs are configured on the network nodes. Um, but when we distribute the routers with DVR, uh, 
every compute node has a, what's called a floating IP namespace. So every, all the NAT takes place on the compute node, and it goes directly to the external network. So the north-south traffic doesn't go through the network node either. But as I, as I note here on the bottom, the problem we had um, that, that we solved, or what we're talking about here, is that when we change the port association, so for example, when you take a floating IP and move it from one virtual machine to another virtual machine, in the centralized routing case, it really just changes a, an IP tables entry, maybe throws away a bunch of contract state, and then communication continues. But on, in the DVR case, when you associate it, reassociate a floating IP between instances, it, it actually has to tear down all that state on one compute node, has to build it up on another one, it has to send out gratuitous ARPs. That takes more time. ARPs can get lost, and so you can run into some issues there. Um, there it works pretty well, but in a few cases, like um, that Swami will involved. talk about, it, it actually caused us problems. So one other thing um, I'll give you some background on is uh, allowed address pairs. It's a, it's a neutron extension um, for the ports that basically lets you associate a MAC and an IP address with a port, regardless of what sits behind it. So, for example, if you wanted to run a virtual IP, you can create a neutron port with an address pair. You can associate or, or add an IP to it, and then you can have an instance um, with a different IP use that virtual IP, and that way the traffic will flow through, uh, it will be allowed to flow through to the instance where otherwise it would get blocked by the anti-spoofing code. So it allows you to migrate so, um, the VIP between two instances and do HA. And this is used by Octavia um, and other load balancing as a service things. And, and so Octavia is using VRRP, so they have, you know, two or more instances. They have a virtual IP. They're making sure the other's up. Um, master always has the VIP. The slave is waiting for the master to die and taking over the VIP. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the, the general uh, uh, definition I just stole from Wikipedia. So now I'll give it off to Swami to talk about neutron port binding and... Uh... Yeah, so the, the way that we implemented DVR uh, is basically uh, completely dependent upon uh, host binding and port binding. So in the case of uh, ML2, we have different types of port binding. So the ML2 legacy routers have uh, default port binding where you bind a port to a host whenever a, a VM requests for a network port and then network port comes in and NOVA actually kinds of tags in which host actually is trying to uh, plug in the WIF port. So that way, the port has um, uh, an address, which, which means it, it has a host where it is actually residing. So that way, we know this port is residing on this host. So in the case of DVR, when we distribute the routers, we had a different kind of port binding other than the legacy port binding, where we extended the port binding to do uh, port binding for the DVR router ports, because each of the router ports will still have a single IP, but it will have the same MAC but it will be actually replicated on every node that we have, and each and every node uh, host information is actually bounded to that router interface. So that way we know if that port is bounded to a particular host, we go and create a router in those nodes. So uh, as far as a VM is concerned, when a VM comes up, the VM port itself has a port binding where it says, okay, I'm on host A and I'm on host B. When it is on host A, we know for sure that the host A has a, has a VM, and it is that VM network is part of a routed network, so we need to go create a router on that node and then provide all those information uh, to create either floating IP or any router update that comes in that actually goes to that particular node. But if there is no host binding, um, DVR has no clues of what to do because if a port comes in without any host binding, it says, okay, there is a port, and you, you have actually created um, uh, basically a floating IP, or, or you create a, a, a VM, basically a, a port, and then you don't bind a host to the port. Then you associate that VM to a network, which is being routed, but the router update even does not know to which host I need to notify in order to create a router for this uh, 
object. So in, the, in this case, the, the two important things that we need to note is basically the device owner and the, and the binding host ID, which is basically the attributes of the port binding table. So the device owner, so what, uh, what DVR did is, when we implemented the DVR, uh, we took into consideration that we are kind of deviating away from the legacy routers. So the legacy routers had uh, like router interfaces, but we actually um, changed the device owner type to be uh, like distributed interfaces so that whenever we see a distributed interface, it's a, it's a router interface that's been used by uh, the distributed routers. As well as when we see a device owner as compute none, which is basically a, a VM, uh, in, the, in this case as a device owner, okay, then it's a VM, so DVR has to service that ports. So those are the DVR serviceable ports. We have a list of DVR serviceable ports for which the DVR has to provide service, which is basically compute. Uh, we actually uh, included the DHCP uh, ports as well as uh, the LBAS ports, because at that time the LBAS was also included in, in V1. So we didn't have an issue with LBAS uh, in V1 because V1 was not using uh, VRRP through allowed address pairs. So this issue that we are talking about came in later when um, load balancer actually moved from V1 to V2 when they moved to Octavia. And then it's not only the Octavia one because uh, I have spoken to other customers uh, who are uh, generically using VRRP uh, using the allowed address pairs and uh, having some kind of redundancy to use um, keepal ID to do uh, instance failover, those kind of things. In, in all those cases, because those ports are not bound to any host because they are unbound ports, and in that case, when you assign a floating IP to an unbound post, uh, and then you have access uh, through floating IP, DVR does not have any clues, and it was actually kind of neglecting it because it doesn't know what to do. So, um, well, since I was talking about uh, the negligence of uh, DVR based on host binding, so what uh, I wanted to talk about is how the DVR router scheduler works today and, and how it's going to work uh, for the, uh, addressing this allowed address pairs uh, issue. So the DVR router uh, scheduler today, what it does is um, whenever a router has been created, it does not do anything, but when you try to add an interface to a router and then it immediately schedules the router to the DVR SNAT node. That is the similar behavior to the legacy routers where you, as soon as you add an interface to a router, you go ahead and actually schedule the router to the DVR SNAT node or the network node or the centralized node, whichever you call it. So once this router is scheduled, what we do is in the case of DVR, when a VM pops up on host A or host B, the VM comes up and the VM port comes up. So the ML2 plugs in the wave port and there is a port update that happens with the host binding. The port update information actually triggers an event from ML2 to the Neutron server says, okay, hey, I see a port here that the VM has been added to this port and uh, you want to take any action on this one. So a port update even comes to the Neutron server and the Neutron server sees, okay, there's a port update then I need to do, take any action. And, and looks at the, what, what's the type of port and is it associated, associated with a router? Yeah, it is associated with a router and it, if it is a DVR router and, and these ports have a service device owner, which if it is a compute uh, or if it is an LBAS or if it is a DHCP, then we know that these are the ports that we need to provide service to. So if these ports are there and if there is a valid host binding on those ports, then we notify that host saying that hey, you have a, a VM right now that where it requires a routing service, so go ahead and start your routing service there. So that's how the notification goes from Neutron server uh, to the agents. It's not a scheduler but because we have kind of splitted the scheduling aspect from that of uh, notifying the agents. Uh, this was done like two cycles before. So it's, it's, it's automatically scheduled to the DVR SNAT agent nodes, which is the centralized nodes, and then the notification goes to the hosts that are actually um, hosting those VMs where the router is required. And once the notification goes, the agent then actually processes the notification and then, then goes back again to the server, says, okay, give me back all the information about the router, okay, give me all the information, like uh, sync data. So when, when we sync the data, when we provide the full details about the routers, then we fetch in all the information about the router, like if it has floating IP, if it has all those information. We collect all those information and, and give it to the agent. And even in that case, 
we basically check if it has the host binding on it. If it does not have a host binding, we say, okay, there's nothing to process for this floating IP, just forget about it. Need to watch time a little. Yeah. So, um, so this is the flow I talked about for the um, current scheduler. So if you, if you can look at it, so you, you can see that um, there is a router create and then add interface and then router update event actually is triggered uh, and then the scheduler schedules it to the network node. Then if there is a valid service port and host binding, there is a notify host to create routers is being sent to the um, agent that actually has it and then the agent actually requests for a sync data, and then the server again sends all the information to the agents regarding uh, what it has to do. So it, it's the same case for floating IP as well. When a floating IP is created, it again sends a router update event uh, to the agents that has actually this router configured, and then the, it requests for a sync data, and if there is a valid service port and host binding, then we again send all the information to the host. So this is how the current scheduler works. So in this case, uh, if you see, the scheduler is completely dependent upon, upon the host binding and the device owner. So that's the reason we have been um, missing this floating IP that has been configured for the VRRP port or the allowed address pair port that was actually utilized by the Tevia. So, um, so this is the slide that captures about the limitations because we, as I mentioned, uh, the DVR routers has a tight dependency on ports, host binding to be scheduled in compute host, and then unborn ports are kind of untouched and we don't worry about those, those things. So VRRP ports or allowed address patch ports are not bound to any permanent host, so we don't take any action on that. So again, when floating IPs are configured on these ports, we, we neglect those ports because we, they are not host bound. So I think this is, uh, yeah, again, um, with respect to DVRs, uh, floating IP has a sequence of events that needs to happen in order to create a floating IP and provide north-south access for DVRs. Because when you configure floating IP, as I said, the scheduler now knows, okay, you have a host binding, then I need to go create the floating IP namespace on the compute host where the VM resides. It needs to tie the router namespace to the FIP namespace. And then once it ties the router namespace to the FIP namespace, it actually uh, configures the rules, the DNAT rules on the router namespace, and then it sends a GARP message from the FIP namespace to the outside world saying that, hey, the, the IP address that you are looking is in this node. So, so once the GARP message goes in, then the external network knows, okay, the, the floating IP, uh, the, the private IP is behind this node, and then any, any traffic that comes in actually flows through. So these are the sequence of actions that needs to take, um, take place when a floating IP is configured. So there are, there are it's, it's, it's a time consuming process. Uh, it's not a, a, a quick failover or, or a quick um, create and uh, delete event. So it needs to create FIP namespace, add rules, send a GR, and then everything will flow in. So um, for the float, I just talked about the floating IP, the router namespace, and the FIP namespace. So this picture shows so shows you uh, in a compute host um, there is a the, the upper um, dotted square or rectangle that you see is the router namespace, and the bottom one you see is the FIP namespace. So uh, so from the router namespace there is a VETH pair that we actually try to uh, connect to the FIP namespace, the RFP and the FPR port. Uh, it has an IPv4 uh, link local address between them, uh, and the traffic is actually chained. Um, so any traffic that comes in, we have an IP uh, table rule uh, on the Q router namespace for the floating IP that's been configured. So if, if the traffic is coming from that source IP, we know that source IP has a floating IP, and we forward all the traffic to the uh, RFP port, which is being directed to the FIP namespace. And the FIP namespace internally has uh, um, floating IP gateway port, which is, the, which is an IP that's been consumed from the public network that you have configured. So once we have the public IP in there, all the traffic goes uh, out. And the traffic coming in enters the FG port, and then we again know, okay, this traffic is coming in for this uh, source IP, and then we know in which router namespace that actually FIP namespace is configured, and we forward the traffic to that one, and it goes in. It, this is just uh, for people who are unaware about how the FIP namespace and router namespace works. Uh, there may be some uh, audience in here who might already know about this one. Sorry for if I'm repeating it. So uh, again, um, 
this is the same case for the network node. In the case of network node, um, we have an, a separate SNAT namespace through which the SNAT is being configured. Uh, and then the DNAT is basically done in the FIP namespace. If you want, in case if you are actually running a, a, a NOVA agent on the network node, and if you have a VM in there and if you're configuring a floating IP, then you have a floating IP namespace as well as the SNAT namespace. So the, um, I, I kind of briefed uh, through about the issues that we had with, uh, with the design aspects and what are the things that uh, consumes time. So in this case, um, we actually went with two different models. One is the distributed model and the other one is a centralized model. Uh, if we wanted to go with the distributed model for supporting the allowed address pairs, uh, the issue that we had was it's a slow failover and uh, because if you have a VRRP port and if you're trying to ping it and if you want to have a, a short time uh, to actually migrate it to the new VM, we cannot, um, with, with the time mentioned or, or the required by the Keepal ID, it was not as easy for us to create a FIP namespace and then add these rules and, and everything to go through. And again, in that case, if you wanted to have this one working, we need some sort of uh, ARP message coming in from the, from the VM, actually that is actually switching the IP from, switching the MAC from one VM to another VM for this VRRP port. And once we get the ARP, we need to actually poll for the ARP in the router namespace, and then when the ARP message comes in, then we need to go ahead and create the FIP namespace, and then send a GARP message and say, okay, now this IP and MAC is serviced on this node, and here is uh, the GARP message. And then when it switches back, then we have to go rip off this one and then recreate it, which is a tedious job. And uh, again, it, 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 it does not solve the problem of um, a high availability with respect to VRRP when you're trying to solve this problem. So, the, so we, what we thought is, okay, the, eas the easiest and the reliable solution and fast failover is basically to use the centralized node to do this uh, unburn port uh, FIP, name, uh, FIP feature. So any port that comes as an unbound port that does not have any host binding, we actually go ahead and actually create a FIP namespace on the centralized node, not, a, not on the distributed node. So it will be always centralized. So any traffic coming from outside, it can hit the centralized node. And it, if it needs to reach the VM, it can actually basically use the east-west path to reach the VM. So, um, so this is the one that uh, I just mentioned. So we have... Um, different ways of doing it, but right now what we're doing is we are trying to do it through network node, and then the DNAT rules are actually configured um, in the SNAT namespace, not on the FIP namespace, because we, the FIP namespace is kind of um, DBR specific, and then this one, uh, since it's an unbound, we don't want to um, combine both unbound and, and bound ports, so what we are doing is we are creating these unbound FIPs on the SNAT namespace, not on the uh, FIP namespace. And uh, currently we have these two patches right now up for review. Uh, one is the server side patch and the other one is the agent side patch. And uh, here is the new change for scheduling the unbound ports. So what we're doing is uh, when the floating IP is configured, when a router update uh, request is sent out, before the router update is sent out, what we do is we check for if the floating IP uh, has any unbound ports on it. If there is an unbound port, what we do is um, we assign a host. We, we actually, we don't send the information notification to all the agents. We only send the notification to the DVR uh, SNAT agent, which is basically the network node. So the, the notification goes to the SNAT agent and the SNAT agent receives the notification and it sends a sync request back to the server and then the server uh, responds back saying that, okay, um, for this one, because it's an unbound port, I am going to tag it as an SNAT bound port, and then it sends the request back, and when the agent receives the information as a SNAT bound port, it, it goes and actually creates the floating IP uh, rules in the, in the SNAT namespace. So this is how it's going to be implemented. So, so if you look at this one, uh, this is still a distributed model, but what we are going to do is we are going to implement the floating IP in the SNAT namespace and uh, any traffic uh, for the unbound ports and any traffic that comes in will, will actually take the east-west path to reach the VMs. So in this case, I have shown in the picture, like the green VMs, VM1 and VM3 has um, the same allowed address pairs that are being configured and those are unbound. So it can actually either go 
to host one or host two, but um, when, when we configure the floating IP for that uh, allowed address pair, it'll be configured in the SNAT namespace and traffic can actually go through that one because they, our SNAT namespace um, has the SG interfaces, which is basically uh, on a private IP on the same subnet as the virtual routers are. So it can actually direct the packet directly to the VMs. So, um, so if you look at the network namespace um, on, on its own uh, on the network node, so the, so the, the rightmost one um, or the, the, the red one in here uh, is basically the legacy router. The legacy router has the QR interface and the QG interface and the, the both SNAT and DNAT is, rules are being configured within this um, namespace. Or in the case of uh, the green one is, is basically the SNAT namespace that the DVR uses. And what we are doing is we have an SG interface, which is basically the private interface and the, and the QG for the gateway. And both our SNAT and DNAT rules uh, will be configured. But, but here the DNAT rules will be configured only for the um, unbound allowed address pair port pairs. And the QR is basically on the Q router namespace. So this is basically, this will give you an idea about how it's currently designed and how the traffic will flow. Again, this is a case where, uh, this is a unique case. It's basically uh, just a test case. Um, this one is, has been designed and allowed right now uh, just for the sake of uh, dev stack, because if you have a dev stack node installation, if someone is testing it on a single node installation, in, in, a, in the case of single node, if you want to do uh, both uh, network node and, and Nova on a single node, then it's an, it's an all-in-one node where you have, uh, you, you can have floating IP namespace as well as the SNAT namespace, everything in all-in-one. So this is, this is a pretty easy all-in-one node where you can actually uh, test your test cases for. And uh, the future plans for scheduling the FIP uh, for bound and unbound ports. So since we had this um, Octavia and the, the VRRP issue, uh, there was a lot of uh, concerns in the community about, okay, uh, how are we going to do this one? Because all we are doing is doing this is without letting know the uh, customers or the administrators uh, where this FIP is being configured. Because when an unborn port comes in, uh, the admins may think, okay, the DVR is always supposed to distribute it. So wherever my VM is, I, I, want, I would expect my uh, FIP to actually go and reside on that VM host. But in this case, we are actually moving to the centralized node. So, so what we did is, in order to give flexibility later um, down the line, it's not implemented yet, but there is an RFP that has been uh, added. Because there was also a requirement from someone saying that, OK, can we have the floating IP to be configured, configurable, where you can actually have floating IPs either in the centralized node or distributed. So this way, uh, this RFV actually deals with uh, the configuration option where you can actually configure floating IPs either in the centralized node or distributed, or it can be dynamically switching back and forth. If the agent is, if there is no valid agent available on the compute host, it actually go, go ahead and, and implements it on the centralized node. So that is the RFV. So if you have any questions on the RFV, you can go and reply to that RFV bug that we have uh, filed. So we will be working on this one, either um, the pike cycle if you have some time uh, otherwise, it will be done on the Queen's cycle. So uh, that's all we had uh, to share. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask us. Uh, hello. Thank you Hi. for the presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First one, um, this DVR functionality and everything you've been telling uh, right now, is it already in place in it, any release of uh, OpenStack? Yeah. The, the DVR functionality has been introduced in Kilo. So okay. we, we are almost like two years now, two and a half years. And so you don't have to do anything to explicitly enable it. It's just there and it's we, just working. I think you need to enable the agent mode. That's it. When you start the agent mode, uh, you need to start L3 agent on all the compute hosts. Because mm -hmm. in, in the case of legacy routers, you only have L3 agents are, uh, running on the network node. But in the case of DVR node, you need to have L3 agent running on every node. And then the L3 agent has two different modes of operation. One is the DVR SNAT mode, and the other one is the DVR mode. If it is a DVR mode, it's compute only mode. There won't be SNAT configured on that one. But if it is DVR SNAT, then it's uh, uh, SNAT. It allows SNAT to occur. Okay. So and one other thing that I'm missing about this uh, data flow, uh, in case of SNAT, for example, 
uh, we are having um, private IP MAC address mm -hmm. on each host, the mm -hmm. same, and uh, public IP MAC address. I don't know if that's the same or different on each computer. For, for SNAT, we, we still have centralized. We have not distributed SNAT. We okay. only have the floating IPs distributed. But in the case of floating IPs, what happens is each and every compute host, each compute host will consume one, of, one public IP address for the FG port that I showed. For DNAT or SNAT? For the DNAT. DNAT, right. yes. DNAT. Floating IP, that's, that's pretty clear and straightforward. Yeah. Um, so for SNAT, you're saying all the traffic would still go through the centralized Centralized, node. yes. Right. Uh, now, what about for the east-west traffic routable? Uh -huh. uh, still, it's going to be a default gateway, wouldn't it be? Yes, it's, there's a default gateway. We use the same IP and same MAC. But what happens is like when the traffic actually goes out of the host, we actually hide the source MAC of the router. We don't send the source MAC of the router outside the uh, wire. Because before it hits the tunnel, we have an uh, open flow rule that actually swaps the source MAC, with the, which are, each host has a specific DVR MAC that we have. So that MAC has been substituted for uh, when the traffic goes out. And when it comes in, we actually strip out the MAC. And then we swap the MAC. It's, it's routed locally. So it's, you consider it, it would be considered asymmetric. So on outbound, it's, it's switched on the local compute node. And on the reply, it's switched on the remote compute. So you, you, even though the IP and MAC are same on all the nodes, we don't expose those IP and MAC outside. OK, got it. But uh, how would, so now we have IP address of default gateway and mm -hmm. MAC address of the same. Right. And um, you end up with having, and the layer two is uh, connected between all the nodes, all the compute hosts. Mm -hmm. So how come layer two bridging does not get uh, crazy because of having multiple MAC addresses all in all the different, same MAC address in all the different places? No, when you it, say different places, we don't even expose beyond the host. It's, it's within the BR int. Right, yeah, there's no so, so rule to after, rewrite. After the packet crosses the BR int, that MAC is not being sent out of the BR int. Right. It's only, it's only exposed in the integration bridge. If, as far as it is within the integration bridge, it knows that it is within this host. It doesn't go outside. Thank you. OK, you're welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, the floating IP consumption on the um, compute nodes, it's, uh, when it consumes that, it's already configured, or when some V router uh, namespace is spawned on the compute node, then it consumes that. When, when you say consumes, what do you mean by? Uh, like when it is spawned, it's, it's okay. already the, the DVR router. Yeah, oh, so, like okay. So what we used to have is the floating IP namespaces are created okay. uh, for the first VM that pops up on the host. When, okay. when the first serv DVR serviceable port, either uh, uh, a compute VM or a, or a load balancer service on that host, when the, whenever the first VM pops up, that's when, and, and if that VM's private IP has been configured with a floating IP, yeah. it is at that time we go ahead and create the floating IP namespace. And the floating IP namespace is specific for an external network. Each external network will have one floating IP namespace per host. Already configured. Yeah, all, yeah. Not, not already configured. Like when you configure a floating IP yeah. and, and you say, okay, go ahead and update my router with a, a create a floating IP and associate a port, it is at that time this, the server actually notifies the agent saying that there is a VM on your host and your VM's IP address now has been configured with a floating IP. Go ahead and create all the rules for that. Oh, okay. And then now my, our agent that's running on the compute host will actually go and create the FIP namespace and then it will create all these plumbings. But once the FIP namespace is already created, the second VM that comes in and if you create a floating IP, it doesn't recreate the floating IP namespace because the namespace is already there. All it does is it actually recreates the rules. That's it. So it consumes only one IP. It, it consumes IP. one Perfect. public IP. And we also have a, a, a work through on yeah, that. Yeah, we, we, you know, that was a, a problem because it, if it was a true um, globally routed IPv4 address, people mm -hmm. didn't like us using them. So. In uh, Newton cycle, we actually added a feature where you can have two subnets on the external network, mm -hmm. and you can tag one as being the one you use for your routers, because their data probably isn't going to leave the data center, and then the other one you can use for floating IPs. So it's called subnet service types, mm 
was what we called it, and you can tag the um, subnet as usable by certain device owners. And um, it's, I know it's on the OpenStack docs page. On There's an example on, on how to use it. And um, you know. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, any other questions? So uh, yesterday there was a discussion on uh, uh, how to distribute uh, yeah, SNAT yeah. and avoid the dependency on uh, uh, the centralized uh, network right. node, right? Yeah. So the approach that you described for unbound ports, is it adding, I'm just wondering if this is adding one more dependency on the centralized SNAT or uh, uh, what happens when SNAT gets distributed? How, how does it... if, if SNAT gets distributed, we can actually completely get rid of the FIP name Swiss that we have today. And we can reuse the SNAT namespace for everything. Uh, even for the unbound? Uh, yeah. I see. Okay. So, so, it, so it makes our life easier because the, the way that we designed initially uh, to split the SNAT was basically to have the, because at that time the service function chaining was not there. So we, was, we were having VPN as a service running in the network node. So we wanted to support the VPN as a service. We need an, an entry point or an endpoint for a VPN as a service for your cloud. So we thought that having the SNAT uh, uh, functionality to reside in a centralized node always makes sense. So that's why we left it there at the centralized. But if you wanted to distribute, then we don't have, an, and, and if we are ready to consume or burn IP addresses on a per router basis, then it's easy for us to move the FIP into this one because the FIP logic is already there. Okay. Just turn on the flag and then use that one. But I think in that case, because it depends upon uh, what is your use cases, because if some people say, okay, I don't want to burn IP addresses, because we don't have a right solution yet without burning an IP address. Right. But if you are ready to burn an IP address, then this can be moved into that one. Right. Because the only reason is um, with the same model, um, we cannot use with one, consuming with one single IP because we can, uh, the SNAT traffic will be shared. Because in FIP namespace, we are sharing, but we are actually preventing it through uh, connection tracking. So that way, we are preventing the, uh, we have some, some kind of security. But in the case of SNAT, I don't, I don't think we can share those things. Right. So you yeah. need one uh, IP. Yeah, per, one IP per, per router. Per tenant. Per router. Right. right. <laughs> Even per, yeah. yeah. So it, Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, guys, right, thank for you. attending it. If there are no more questions. Thank you, and um, we both will be on the IRC channel. If you guys have any questions, um, please, you can shoot us.